Hey guys, today I'll be reviewing Beyond the Bedroom Wall by Larry Woywood. Show you the book. This book is out of print. Um, I got it on a thrift bookstore. Honestly, just because, as bad as this would say, or is to say, is I enjoyed the cover. I just thought it was very interesting. And then I learned it was basically a family anthology about uh, one family's life in the Midwest, mostly dealing with uh, North Dakota. As the blurb led me to believe, though, a lot of it does take place in Illinois. So, this book looked new. You, it's It's been around with me. I even kind of as much of this as a book's in. I kind of made crevices here because it's, it's pretty thick. And, uh, let's see. The wording's not super tiny, but it's not really big print either. So, it's a long read. But a good one. So, I'll go one. Or how. Like I said before, it's a family anthology. Um, somewhere, it takes place between somewhere, I'm going to guess, late, late 1800s to about the 1960s. And it involves, I would say, the grandparents, parents, and then their kids. But they all kind of interact with each other. This book, I would definitely say, is more of a slice of life. There isn't anything too dramatic. No, no suspense. It's just the beauty of ordinary life. Uh, the only suspenseful things is if someone would, say, get an illness in the book and pass away or anything of that nature is what, um, is the most suspenseful thing in the book. Now, each of the chapters Honestly, I say chapters, but it feels more like it's a couple pages of chapters. But um, each of them are like a short story, per se, and it's not all told from the same character. Um, it tries to go in between all the characters, but more... Certain characters get more uh, face time than others. I would say the father, whose name is Martin, and not the his second oldest son named Charles has the most stories told by uh, from their point of view. Um, honestly, and the thing is. With each story, it's not very continuous, which makes it for a little harder read. It's not a story you can um, just sit down and read, like continuously, because the stories, since it is kind of like short stories between chapters, they involve the same characters, but it's like completely different things, even though it is slice of life. One could be talking about a funeral, one could be going back to childhood and thinking about situations of that nature. Some could be talking about religion. Uh, the family is Catholic in the book. And this was more back when Catholicism wasn't, not really as accepted, but it was, it was more cultural binding than what it is probably with today, today's standards. Um, so I'm going to just look over the chapters, and I'm not going to describe any of them, but the ones that stuck out to me. And the chapters, like, you remember the stories, 
Let's see if I can get it in. There we go. You can remember the stories by just seeing the chapters, uh, the names of the chapters. So about Father Kroll, it talks about, let's just make sure real quick. 17. Maybe not. Okay, now I remember now. I guess I don't remember as well. There's a couple stories that go on with uh, about different priests. This one talks about how uh, Martin's wife, named Alpha, she was raised Lutheran, and her parents weren't, were, I guess, anti-Catholic, or they just didn't like Martin for their daughter. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. Some, maybe a little bit of both. But this comes with uh, Martin's wife uh, gripping, wanting to convert. She's interested in Catholicism. She's she raised her kids in it, and she kind of wants to become it in a way, but she doesn't want to commit. And it just deals with her conversations with the priest. It's not religious per se. It's kind of like how, how I said before, how Catholicism was more like a cultural thing than it is today. I don't know if for other parts of the world, but this does take place in America. And I, I don't know, I don't feel like anyone, some people will tell you they're Catholic here, but it's not like that sense of culture as it once held for, uh, from my perspective. But yeah, that one just talks about her conversion and so forth. Um, it talks a lot of mundane things, but the way it's written is very beautiful. It's very... Larry uh, Woywood is a poet laureate of North Dakota. I forget what year. I want to say 95. So the way he describes ordinary events in this book is very poetic. Very. Um... Sometimes it can be a little too poetic to where you just kind of want to read more of the story, but it is dripping with symbolism, dripping with emotions. And it's not a light read. It's not a fast read by any stretch. You... I would find it hard for any person, well, myself, um, you cannot sit down and read like a couple chapters of this book because each chapter, even though it involves the same characters, is it goes so back and forth to different situations and sometimes it's not even in the same state, it doesn't involve the same people, and it's just very hard to keep that in focus. Especially sometimes, because it doesn't let you know who's narrating right at the beginning. It is, um, trying to think, you kind of figure it out after a page or two. So, if it's the father narrating or from his point of view in one chapter, it could be one of the, his daughters next, and... Like, you read three pages in before you realize it's, oh, this is the daughter. Sorry, I'm shaking the camera a little bit. So, honestly, it's good, but that was, I'm going to count it as a, not a strike against it, because I couldn't write anything better myself, and it's very poetic, uh, like I said, very beautiful, very, very well structured, but it's not something I could continually read and I don't see a lot of people reading actually the book is out of print um, I got from a thrift uh, thrift website for books and you have to have a lot of your attention span has to be very committed to this 
because since it is such everything's ordinary and he brings out uh, the wonderment of the ordinary, it's very hard to, if you don't have the attention span for it, or if you need plot twist, if you need character, well, not so much, it's a lot of character development, don't get me wrong, but like different situations, like how a person grows, they have to overcome this, they have to overcome that. It's nothing like that. Honestly, this book, show you again. It's real. The characters feel very real, very honest. Um, so you can tell this book was written, most, I think it's the 60s. Let me see real quick. 1965. You can tell it was written during this period, especially from Midwest, uh, Miss, uh, Midwestern America. The way they discuss different races Sometimes, I wouldn't say it, it's not a racist book per se or anything of that nature, but it's very, you know how old people or older people, the elderly, sometimes talk about people who are different than them? It kind of goes on the long, along those lines. Also, um, there's some weird... Uh, laissez faire sexual things going on because, um, it, and one of the discuss, and one of the stories it talks about the kids and they're playing, and the sister's like four or five. I'm going to say somewhere at the brothers like 10 or 12, something around there. And they're discussing their outside plan with other kids. And the sister's like, it's not like the time I had to expose my bottom to you or something, which kind of led to, I don't know, like some sort of sexual molestation, something, or just like, you show me mine, I show you yours. I don't know. Because that's where it cut off. It didn't, and it, the book has like a few examples of this, but it doesn't go in any detail. It's just like, this happened, going on with whatever the story's about, whether it's like them being at a new house, a new neighborhood, whatever. Um... It's just like, it kind of throws this out there, but that's it. It cuts it off completely. So, I don't know. That was a little weird for me. And the sisters never say anything about it, and they never go in detail. when they. And honestly, it's a lot more through the male perspective for this book than the female. I would say the leading female or the female that gets the most stories out of this is uh, the father's wife or the mother. And I always say that because there's so many characters in this book, but it usually go it kind of goes from grandparents, parents to the kids, even though kids do become adults and have kids later on. They don't really focus on the kids' kids or that's how it's just leading up. Hopefully I'm saying this all right. Um, it's very poetic. It has a lot of poetry in here. Like I said before, the author is a poet laureate. I want to say 95. Hold on. Yep, 95. He was named Poet Laureate of North Dakota. So, very poetic. It has a lot of poetry in between the books. Um, I'll read you some, uh, a little bit of excerpts I found. I could read this whole book for all the poetry in it, but I'll read two. So, to have you guys have a basis of it. 
This one's where he's talking about these kids playing war, but, like, I don't know if they're too mean or what, but I'll read. A psychologist or a poet, I suppose, would find deeper meaning in the fact I'm writing this down exactly a week after it began, or at exactly the same hour, but that's foolishness, since Edward is away at Father Garford's playing Pinochle, it's only convenience. I've evaded it long enough, and if I keep up at this rate, I will invade it forever. That would be wrong. Last Friday, Denny and Ronnie were playing with the Dipson boys in the backyard. I heard an argument and went to the kitchen window. They were constantly contesting the death of Jim, Jimmy Dipson. He's the one with the strangely big head. Although I've asked to please keep away from the game of violence, in particular the one they call war, it keeps creeping into... Their play like water onto a sponge. I'm afraid of these boys. They have war in their hearts. The threat of total destruction, the atomic bomb, was forced into their lives. They were born under it. Theirs will be a strange generation, cold and distant, without feeling, incapable of any strong action other than violence. What is torn loose from them by hysteria? And how can we expect more? What raises such a threat to them can't be separated from their lives. And from them, each person will carry within him the possibility of destruction. Afraid of their emotions, their deepest thoughts, their inner being, they will remain detached and on the defensive. It's impossible to ex uh, expect them to separate this threat from people. The ability to do so is a fault in itself as strange and unnatural as those huge white tongues of fungus that stick out of the trunk of a tall, healthy tree. I think of how I was affected as a child when I stood in a patch of sunlight in the forest gathering blueberries or blackberries and turned up to see one above me, gray and glowing, the shadows of leaves clamping onto the bark. They were playing war. As you can see... Um, with I with the atomic bomb and how people seem more detached, how very poetic and everything that part of life, how poetry plays into remembering childhood games, especially ones he uh, they didn't want to play. Uh, I don't know if it's based on the author's family or not, but. I could kind of sense that, or maybe if other families too that he may have known just kind of mingled it together. It definitely seems like it. All right, I'll read one more. This one's a lot shorter, I swear. All right. It seems that generations selling out at auctions are selling to dealers. Those in their late 60s or so are the last generation to care about the continuity of possessions. Their families, their sons and daughters and children and grandchildren seem to want to get rid of the old pieces for the money they were worth now and get something new. Have no family hanging heavy about them. Wood and fabric and leather and other natural materials absorb and the sorrows and joys of those who lived and moved among them or carry or wore them. Only a finish could be sanded away. A chair might reveal its history if touched and handled and listened to with enough patience as an area of the earth could, or the body held against yours. And yet possessiveness and pride, along with the counterbalancing force, fear, were the real bearings to feel. If you played with too many objects and appliances, you could come to think of the universe as a toy. In a perfect world, you would ha have whatever you wanted and live with it without harming others or yourselves. Charles knocked on the desktop with his knuckles. The spirit wasn't any more vaporous than oak or a skank of yarn or a bowl of colored agates. Links lost within the chain. So, yeah.
Charles is the second oldest son. He has a lot, uh, especially towards the second half of the book. Most of the short stories are geared towards him, or take place in his perspective. Honestly, this book does make you feel like a voyeur. Not in the bad sense, I guess. You are just seeing how you feel like you're just watching these people live their lives with it being mundane and spectacular at the same time. I would recommend the book. I wouldn't pay like a lot of money for it. But if you can find it, I guess it depends how much everybody makes, but if you really like antholo family anthologies, especially if you're from the Midwest or if you like uh, the American Midwest, I would highly recommend it. I would say about $20 or less if you can find a copy, or at your library too, if for some reason they might have it. It is out of print, you can't get it on the Kindle or anything. Actually, before I made this video, I looked it up on YouTube. There's a few interviews with the author. Not about this book, just in general. And no one's done a book review for, excuse me, this book. So I guess I'm the first. That's weird. Especially think since you think everything would be on the internet already as is. So this is the first book review of all. So, um... I'm not going to rate it, because I don't know how to rate it, because I couldn't write anything better. It's a very beautiful book. It's not something that could be rushed. You do have to have a lot, a big attention span for it, and I would recommend it if you enjoy family anthologies, if you enjoy history, if you just enjoy stories about people. So thanks guys for watching. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, Lord of the Rings, by J.R.R. Tolkien for the rest, so hopefully, I doubt I'm going to get a review up super soon, but maybe close. I'm about, I'm reading on the Kindle and it's at like 33% or something. So hopefully, I get that review done soon, and thank you guys for watching. Bye.